the passage of scripture today that Pastor Ben will be speaking from. It is uh, Psalm 119, verses 129 through 126. Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. Keep steady my steps according to your promise and let no iniquity get dominion over me. Redeem me from, your, from man's oppression that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. Well, let's start with a thought experiment. Imagine that I found a memoir and I gave you that memoir and I told you that if you could read it and understand it, that you might just be able to get $2 million. Would you try to read it? It's a pretty easy thought experiment, right? Yeah, of course. About a decade ago, this actually happened. In 2010, an eccentric art dealer, millionaire by the name of Forrest Finn, decided to bury an ornate Romanesque looking box somewhere in the Rocky Mountains. And before he buried it, he jam packed it with about $2 million worth of gold and gemstones. And then he wrote a memoir a little bit afterward. And in his memoir, he had this little poem uh, about 24 lines and it was called The Thrill of the Chase. And if you could solve this mysterious little poem, you would be led to the box that was buried somewhere in the Rocky Mountains. So of course, thousands of people got this poem and they dedicated hours of time and energy and resources trying to figure it out, but it was so cryptic, it was really difficult. And the only hints that he provided were these. It's in the Rocky Mountains, okay? It's somewhere between Santa Fe and the Canadian border. It's at an elevation of 5,000 feet, so that helps a little bit. Um, and then also, it's not in a mine, a graveyard, or near any structure. These are all of the hints that you have. And I was reading about this this past week, and so many people sacrificed to try to find this $2 million treasure. I mean, flying to the Rocky Mountains, hiking up and down is between Santa Fe and Canada, um, which is a long ways. I didn't do the math, but it's a long ways. Um, money, safety, to try to find this pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Many of them hiked. At least five of them were killed in the search. Then on Saturday, June 6, 2020, the treasure was found. Here's a picture of the 32-year-old med student from Michigan named Jack Stoof opening the box of treasure with forest Finn, I'm laughing his heart out. <laughs> it's actually, the story's not over. There's so much controversy surrounding this. Evidently, he stole the, the, the solve of the poem from somebody else that led to the fine, and the person who had the solve is now suing him. It's going to be a movie someday. We'll watch it at some point. It's not over, though. Um, but the question remains, again, to go back to it. If I handed you a memoir or maybe there was a poem in it, and I said, if you could read this, and if you could understand it, $2 million worth of treasure would be yours, would you read it? And of course, you would. That's an adventure. Oh, Sammy. I know, that's a tough story. See ya, bud. <laughs> this is really important because I think that story and this question exposes something that's flawed within us. That's something that's a little bit off, and specifically when it comes to how we think about the Bible. I say that it exposes something that's flawed in us because I just saw the most recent data of how American Christians view the Bible this past week. It revealed that most Americans, many American Christians, don't actually read the Bible outside of Sunday morning. I'm not surprised by this. 
the American Bible Society conducts an intensive study every year, and it's called the State of the Bible. It's really fascinating. You can find it on their website. This year, they found that there was an unprecedented drop in Bible users in the United States. I won't get into the nitty gritty, but if you look at the past three or four years, it had been on like this gradual incline. Like maybe it would grow a percent every year of people who started to use the Bible. And when I say use the Bible, I mean like three or four times a year. So that it's not high standards right now. Um, but then in 2022, it dropped dramatically 10%. And 10% of this survey was about 27 million people who just stopped engaging the Bible at all. 2017, LifeWay Research found that while American Christians are fond of the Bible, woohoo, um, most of them don't actually read it on their own, certainly not on a, on a daily basis. It's a good book. It's a helpful book. We'll come hear it preached on a Sunday morning. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're doing this but it will rarely be opened um, during the week. I don't know about you. I, I read also this past week, and I don't know how true this is, but nine out of 10 homes in America have a Bible, and the average home in America has three. Isn't that crazy? The average American home has three Bibles. So I don't know about you. I don't know what your apartment's like. Maybe it's you know decor on your coffee table. Maybe it's like the accent piece on your fireplace mantle. And you're like, that looks really good. And, and you got a big one and it's leather bound and it's got some gold. It's like, that is a pretty looking book. And, and it's on your, but it's never open on your lap. That's where we are. So this exposes a deeply flawed view in us about what the Bible really is. Because if we knew what we had sitting on the table, if we knew what was on that mantle collecting dust, we're buried in the closet if we knew the treasure that was waiting for us on the other side of opening it, it would not be an afterthought. It would be our obsession. It would be like Finn's memoir for all of those readers. It would consume our thoughts. It would occupy our minds. It would captivate our hearts. Every single morning we would wake up and be like, I, I got to look for the treasure again. There's something here for me. I've got to find it. If we knew what we had in our hands, it would be the first thought that crosses our mind in the morning. It would be the last thought on our minds at night, and everything in between would be dominated by it. Since that's not the case, and I think if we're being honest right now, you'd say it's not the case. Maybe for some of you it is. I, I know for some of you it is. That exposes the fact that in spite of all of our resources and podcasts and blogs and seminaries, we don't know what the Bible is. So for the next five weeks, I want to do my best to show you. And just to give you an idea of where we're going, um, I'm going to show you, first of all, why you can trust the Bible. Actually, not first of all. Next week. Next week. <laughs> Second of all, <laughs> why you can trust the Bible. How you actually know it's the word of God, not just some fantasy or some book made up by some men who were trying to get some power. Then I'm going to show you why you can understand the Bible, why you don't have to be a paid professional, why you don't have to go to seminary, that it's clear and it's knowable. And then I'm going to show you in the last two weeks how you can approach the Bible, how you can appropriate it in your life day in and day out, how it can be real for you, how it can be better than life for you. So next week will be the veracity of the word, which is the trustworthiness of the word. Then after that, the clarity of the word. Then after that, the authority of the word. And then finally, the practice of the word. But before we get into any of that, I've got to show you what the Bible is. And that's where we are today. And today, my only goal is to hopefully, maybe for the first time, show you the treasure of the word. That it's better than anything else in this entire world. I asked Doug to read a little snippet of Psalm 119. If you're not there yet, go ahead and get there. We're going to be all over the place in Psalm 119. Um, Psalm 119, if you don't know about it, is the longest chapter in the whole Bible. And that's really fascinating because there's 176 verses. There's 22 stanzas, which it's a song. So just imagine trying to sing a song with 22 verses in it on a Sunday morning. This is a long song right here. We'd be exhausted. We'd be here for an hour. But the point that I want you to see is it's the longest chapter, 
176 verses. And do you know what this song's about? The longest chapter in the Bible is a love song to the Bible. That's what Psalm 119 is all about. It's gushing 176 verses over the word of God. Passion, love, longing, zeal, desire, delight are just some of the words that David uses to describe how he feels about this book. As one author put it, if he was writing this psalm to a woman, we'd be blushing because we'd be embarrassed for him because he'd just be laying all his emotion out there. His heart would be on his sleeve and we'd be like, hold it back, man. <laughs> like, save some for later. That's how much gushing is going on in this book. Clearly, David knows something about the Bible that American Christians don't. He has experienced something in this book that most of us have never experienced. Whoa. I felt that. That sub is right under me. It was just like shockwave. Sorry. Okay. Um, where was I? Can I tell you something really crazy about David? He's gushing about the word of God. Do you know what the word of God was for David? Do you know what he had access to? He had snippets of the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those are the books that we're like leapfrogging over, you know? Those are the books that were like, oh, this is a little difficult. This is a little boring. This is a little confusing. This is a little outdated. That's all David had access to was snippets of that. And he's like, this is better than life. Whoa. Stuff's incredible. It's like buried treasure. And another song he wrote, your rules are true and righteous all together. And then he said this, more to be desired than any gold even fine gold, sweeter also than honey, even drippings of the honeycomb. In other words, David thought that the treasure of the word of God was greater than the treasure of wealth. So if I had to offer you $2 million or maybe the last copy of this book, which one would you take? David's like, it's not a competition. He thought that it was more enjoyable than the sweetest honey dripping off the honeycomb, which is another way of saying that the word of God was the most valuable, enjoyable, and desirable thing he had ever experienced in his life. Could you imagine saying something like that about the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers? Hopefully by the end of the day. So the big question is, what did David know about this book that we don't? What treasure had he discovered in these pages that you have not found yet? And even more importantly, if you knew what he knew and you could find what he had found, how would it change your life? That's what we're going to explore today. Now, like I said, there are 176 verses in this psalm. I'm not going to be able to do them justice in 30 or 40 minutes. I'm not going to scratch the surface, but... There are a few uh, snippets here that I'm going to highlight because I think they get to the heart of the matter. I think they show us why David thought the word of God was so incredible and so valuable. And so I'm going to show you some of these snippets. The first one is in the opening verses, and they're really going to be four things I'm going to show you. So if you have your Bibles open, let's look at these first two verses together, Psalm 119, 1 and 2. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. And this is the first thing I want to show you. The word of God for David is the greatest treasure in the world because it leads to happiness. That word blessed or blessed in the Hebrew could literally be translated happy. Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. The, the point is that anyone who reads this book and who understands this book, more importantly, who keeps this book is going to be happy. Now, this is really important for us to understand because I think a lot of Christians don't get this about the word of God. You see, I think most of us get the fact that the word of God is supposed to lead us to joy. Uh, but at the same time, most of us have no idea that it's meant to lead us to happiness because joy and happiness are two different things. 
there's a major difference between joy and happiness. Joy is a virtue. Joy is a command. Joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit, which means it's a gift. It's basically the ability to face hardship to face suffering, to face trial, maybe even persecution with a spirit of contentment and gratitude and hope. A perfect example of joy would be the apostle Paul as he's rotting away in a Roman prison and he's awaiting his trial and he's hungry and he's thirsty and he's poorly dressed and he's chained to a Roman guard 24 seven and most of his ministry partners have abandoned him and now all these other guys are rising up and they're starting ministries to pour salt in his wounds out of greed and selfish ambition. All kinds of stuff is is going on in his life. And yet Philippians 4.12, he says, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's joy. That's a virtue. That's a gift. It's a fruit of the spirit. It's a command. We're supposed to rejoice in all things. Now, happiness is totally different than that. Happiness is circumstantial. Happiness is emotional. Happiness is not a conscious decision. It just is the natural feeling that you get in response to good things that are happening around you or inside of you. Like, it's the feeling that you have when you have the sense that everything is as it should be, which is what the Bible calls shalom, which is where we're all headed, by the way. You feel happy. And I don't know about you, but for most of my Christian life, I was told that, that the way of Jesus is not about feelings. That the way of Jesus is actually about decisions, knowing the right thing and doing the right thing. And happiness is not part of it. Nothing could be further from the truth. Yesterday was a happy day for me and my family. Hopefully it was for you as well. It was beautiful outside. Started off with some soccer and Nicholas had a couple of games and that's always really fun to watch. And we got out the pool. And when I say we got out the pool, we have converted a horse trough that I found in our woods into a pool. (laughs) And so it's been leaning up against the side of my house. We're really classy. Our neighbors love us. And, uh, Rolled that horse trough down. We filled it up and the kids played in that pool for hours. We just lounged outside on the hammock, on the couches, watched some basketball. We had cookout for lunch. It was one of those days where like at the end of the day, Carolina and I looked at each other and we're like, that was a good day. That was, that was Sabbath. That was, oh man, that was good. We were happy. Guys, there's a major distinction here between joy and happiness. Joy transcends circumstance. Happiness depends on circumstance. Joy is a conscious decision. Happiness is a subconscious reaction. One is a state of being, and the other is a fleeting emotion. And every single one of us want happiness. This is what I want you to see, though. Most Christians believe that the Bible was given to them so that they could have joy and not happiness. And so happiness is something that you have to find somewhere else. I'll go to the Bible for virtue. I'll go to the Bible for what's right and what's true. But if I want to be happy, I got to go somewhere else. There's like pleasure out there. There's money out there. There's fame or popularity or relation or whatever it is. I got a happiness is somewhere out there, not in here. This is what I thought for most of my life. The Bible has everything to do with virtue and nothing to do with pleasure, everything to do with rules, nothing to do with rewards, everything to do with answers, not our affections. The Bible is there to help us have joy in the midst of hard times. But if we want happiness, we've got to go somewhere else. For David, though, the psalmist, it was both. And this is so massive for you to get. It is rules and it is reward. It is duty and it is delight. It is virtue 
and it is pleasure. For David, it wasn't just a book that would help him get through the bad times. It was the book that led him into the good times as well. If you keep this, you will be happy. That's a promise. That is the word of God. You can take it to the bank. If you follow the commands, you will be happy. Happy are those whose way is blameless. Happy are those who keep his testimonies. If happiness is circumstantial, and it is, then the circumstances that will lead you to the most and the deepest happiness are knowing and seeking and doing and keeping the word of God. If you're not happy, all you got to do is check your rhythms in the word. There's a correlation. This is why the science of happiness and well-being is always catching up to the Bible, by the way. I'm going to start a podcast at some point, and it's just going to be called The Science is Catching Up to Jesus, because I see this over and over and over again in my life, and I just want to write them all down and share them with you, because there's so many examples. But I've mentioned before, probably a year or two ago, there's a podcast called The Happiness Lab, and it's with Dr. Lori Santos, and she teaches at Yale, and it's all about the psychology of happiness, and it's so fascinating, and I really enjoy it. But every time I listen to it, I just laugh because every single episode points back to the Bible. She'll like show a study or she'll find some kind of psychological discovery and everyone's shocked by it. And the scientific community is like, I can't believe this is, this is what is real about happiness. And I'm just laughing. I'm like, that that was in the Bible. That was 2000 years ago. Like, this is not new. You know, but the science is always catching up. For example, one episode was on the importance of having a, a, an attitude of gratitude. My mom used to say that to me when I was growing up, and I hated it. Have an attitude of gratitude. I'm like, I'm washing dishes like I want to die. <laughs> but you need an, and I, now I say it to my kids, and they hate it too. You know, have a spirit of gratitude, son. And, and, and then on this episode, she's like, no, it's actually so important. Complaining actually leads you away from happiness and away from well-being. But if you have an attitude of gratitude, it actually leads to happiness. And I just am laughing. I'm like, oh, no, like they were right. And then I'm like, this is, this is actually 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The science is always just catching up. The science of happiness, it's it's not new. Another episode was on the science of forgiveness, and I've talked about this before, so I won't belabor it, but she showed that if you really want to be happy in spite of hurt and in spite of trauma and in spite of people um, not treating you correctly, if you really want to be happy in spite of all of that, the first step is you have to forgive them. It's the first step. And all the science is showing this now, and I'm, I'm just, again, I'm, I'm like, this is the Bible. It's Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ gave, Christ and God forgave you. That was a typo, sorry. Another episode's about serving others. This is so fascinating to me. Now, in this episode, she talked about the paradox of happiness is that the less you think of yourself and the more you think about others, the happier you will become. It's the Bible. Philippians 2, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Guys, the list goes on and on and on and on. And every single episode I'm listening to this, and I'm like, this is, this is, this is all in the Bible. But this is the thing that always frustrates me about the podcast and all of the science of well-being stuff. And that's the fact that they're, they're good at like sciencing the steps, right? They're good at discovering, oh, you know what? If we do this, then we'll be happier. If we forgive, then we'll be happier. If we forget ourselves, then we'll be happier. If we have an attitude of gratitude, then we'll be happier. They're good at identifying the steps. You know what they're really bad at? Giving us the resources to actually take those steps. Like, how do you forgive people that have hurt you? How do you have an attitude of gratitude when your life stinks? When nothing's going well? How do, you, how do you forget yourself when your heart is curved inward and all you think about is yourself? Well, they can identify the steps, but they can't give us the resources to take them outside of the Bible. 
There are no resources. The Bible is unique in the world, and this is what I want you to hear. The Bible is valuable in the world. The Bible is a treasure to the world because not only does it show us the steps we need to take in order to arrive at happiness, but it actually gives us the resources to take them as well. That is so valuable. Forgive others as God has forgiven you. He loves you so much that he's given you everything in Christ, identity, purpose, freedom, glory, and hope. So no matter how hard your life is, no matter how much you think it stinks, you have something to be thankful for. Not only that, you know how you can forget yourself? You know how you get cured of selfishness in your heart? You look to Jesus, Philippians 2, 5, it continues, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. It's already yours. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In the word of God, we see the pathway to happiness. And the pathway is paved for us by the person of Jesus Christ. And if you are in Christ, you have his spirit and he enables you to walk that path. And so the word of God leads us to happiness and is the greatest treasure in the world. You want to be happy? How are you doing in the word? You struggling with happiness? There's a correlation. Second, the word of God is the greatest treasure in the world because it leads us to truth. Psalm 119, 29. Your testimonies are wonderful, and therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your word gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. And then verse 160, the sum of your words is truth. And every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Guys, when I think about our world today, um, I think about all of the issues that we're facing, and we're facing a lot. It's not, it's not pretty out there right now, let's be honest. Um, I think one of the most significant issues out of all of them is the fact that we don't know what truth is anymore. Not only do we not know what truth is anymore, we don't know who's telling us the truth anymore. I mean, we're just caught in the middle of the crossfire of people going back and forth as Jesus looked at, at his people um, in Matthew 9 and said he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. I feel like that's what we are right now. We're like sheep without a shepherd because all of our shepherds keep lying to us and leading us astray. We're told that we can trust a health organization. This is not going to be a political, political talk. Don't worry. Um, but then we find out a couple years later that they were lying to us. And then it makes you question everything. We're told that we can trust a news source. And then we find out that they're covering things up and making up stories. Both sides of the political aisle are constantly telling us that the other side is a bunch of liars and shouldn't be trusted. And yet at the same time, many of the leaders on both sides are making deals under the table to pad their own pockets. And you're just like, who are we supposed to trust? Like, who's telling us the truth? We have been betrayed by our government. We've been betrayed by the church. We've been betrayed by Hollywood and the media and every other meaningful institution in our culture. And so in a very significant and existential way, we have become like sheep without a shepherd. Who has the truth? Where are we supposed to go? What are we supposed to do? We've got a lot of experts in this country but the problem is that our experts have their own agendas. The problem is that our experts have their own biases. The problem is that our experts have their own tribes. And we don't know which ones are actually telling the truth. I was at AT&T a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, next to the eye doctor, I avoid AT&T. You know, like second on my list, you know. Um, I'm not a tech guy. Could, I could not care less about phones and watches and all that kind of stuff. And, and so I had an old phone and it, it would die by noon every day. 
And, um, and uh, you know, I'm a pastor. People like to call me and ask me things and they want to meet with me. And I'm, and, and I'm like planting a church and my phone dies by noon. And I was kind of nice. I was just like, oh, sorry, my phone was dead. You know, like <laughs> it wasn't my fault, you know, um, but I needed to get a new phone. It was, it was at that point in time where it was just trash. And so I went to AT&T right over here. And I know nothing about phones. So I brought Caleb with me. Caleb's a phone guy, you know, and he knows, all, he knows things and he cares. Um, and so I, uh, I took Caleb with me to be my guide, to help me. And, and I, I, but I, I was like, I'm going to ask the expert. This expert gets paid to know everything about phones. And so I just walked up to this guy. It was time for me to upgrade. I could buy any phone in there for free, basically. So I, I wasn't buying it. I was just upgrading my phone for free. And, uh, and I was like, what's the best phone in here? Because I'm going to get the best phone in here. I'm going to leave and that's it. And, I don't, and I'm not going to be in here a second longer. And he's like, oh, it's definitely this Samsung, like, whatever it was. <laughs> See, I don't even know what it was. And I'm like, are you sure this is the best phone? And Caleb's over there shaking his head. He's just like, nope. No, it's not. And, and, I, and so now I have, a, I have, like, two angels on my shoulder right now. And one of them is, like, telling me that I have to get an iPhone. This is Caleb over here. And, and, and he's like, you have to get an iPhone. The iPhone's the best. And I'm like, why is it the best? He's like, it just is. And I was like, well, that doesn't help. And, and then the, the expert is like, you have to get a Samsung. And, and I'm like, why? And he's like, it's the best phone here. I was like, well, expert or my friend. And so I went with the expert. And, and, I, uh, and I left, like, fully confident in my decision, 100% confident. And everybody made fun of me. Like Kayla made fun of me for months. Jonathan made fun of me. Anytime, anytime somebody found out that I got this phone, they made fun of me. And, and I, but I was totally secure in this. And I would make fun of them back because I would be like, oh, you're just like a slave to a brand. You know, you just bought it because of a logo. Like I got the best phone in the store. And, uh, and I was fully confident in my decision. So then I'm hanging out with a friend about a year later. And, um, and this friend used to sell phones. And, uh, and he's making fun of me for my phone. And I realized, like, phone persecution's a thing. And I, I did not know that. And, and it was just like, wow, everyone with an iPhone is so arrogant. Like, you, you are the new Pharisees. Um, and so, so he's making fun of me. And, uh, and I was like, listen, man, the expert told me it's the best phone in the store. He's like, Ben, Ben, they get paid more commission for selling non-Apple phones. And I was like, what? <laughs> and it, I mean, it was like my world shattered. Not because I got a bad phone, but because I was lied to by an expert at a store. And he's like, everyone knows Apple's the best. And so the salesmen get paid more to sell non-Apple. What? I was so mad. Oh, I was so mad. To this day, I, my blood boils <laughs> that the expert had led me astray. Guys, I can't help but feel like that's where we are in society today. You know, it's not just AT&T. Truth isn't as important as the bottom line. Money rules, power rules, our experts are in it for themselves. Narratives are spun, agendas are pushed, lies are sold. And we're just down here like sheep, desperate to know what's right, what's real, what's true about the world. This is why the book that is collecting dust on your shelf is so valuable. It is truth. The sum of its words, as verse 6 says, are truth. And look back at verse 6. I don't have a slide. If you take its advice, if you walk in its ways, if you keep its commandments, verse 6 says, you will never be put to shame. that's another way of saying you're never going to get to a point where you realize you've been lied to. You're never going to have one of those moments that I had where someone pulls back the curtain and shows you what's really going on behind the scenes. And you're like, are you kidding me? If you follow this book, you're never going to get to a point where you've taken advice and you find out you shouldn't have, where you obey a command and you're like, well, I really wish I hadn't, I hadn't have obeyed that because that ruined my life. That's what it means that the sum of its words are truth, that it will never put you to shame. You can bank your life on it and be confident that it will lead you into happiness. Isn't that valuable? 
Isn't that the greatest treasure in the world? Of course it is. Guys, since it's true, the more you obey it, this is so amazing, the more you obey it, the more it validates itself in your life. And so it's the opposite of putting you to shame. You take the advice and then you thrive. And you're like, whoa, that worked. Reward is always on the other side of obedience. So you obey and then you get the reward and you're like, whoa, it isn't just about rules. The rule led to something amazing. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. For he who fears the Lord, his children will spring up like stalks and his wife is going to thrive around him. Blessed, happy is the man who fears the Lord because his family is going to thrive. And so you start obeying the Lord and you're faithful and you pray and you're in the word and and you're not cheating on him with your eyes, with your mind, and, and you're not harsh with him and you're kind and you're gentle and you're patient. All of a sudden they start springing up around you and you're like, I, I have an Eden in my home. And you're like, what? It works. It's amazing. He proves himself over and over again, as the old hymn writer put it. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. (laughs) What if you took him at his word? Just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord, you can take it to the bank. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him how I've proved him or and or Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him more. The more you obey, the more he proves himself in you, the more you prove him to the world. It's real, it's true. You can trust him with your life. And that's why the Bible is the most valuable treasure in the whole world because it leads us to truth. Third, The word of God is the greatest treasure in the world because it leads us to peace. Look at this ensemble here, verse 92. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Verse 143, trouble and anguish have found me out, but your commandments are my delight. 165, great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. I think one of the most amazing things about the Bible is that the Bible is a place of peace. It's a place of comfort. It's a place of refuge. I don't know if you've ever had a place like that. Maybe it's a cabin in the mountains, maybe by the lake. Maybe you're a beach person. It's a condo by the sea. Maybe you've got a spot in the woods somewhere that nobody knows about, and you can go and you can retreat, and it's yours. And it's a place of peace for you. It's a place of healing for you. It's a place of rest for you. And you recover there in your moments of chaos. When I was in college, I had a spot like this that I'd go to when I was struggling, you know, with college struggles, like breakups and sports injuries. I would say school, but (laughs) like, (laughs) it was like my heartache was wrapped up in sports and girls. And that was it. Um, and then I met my wife after college. So it was a lot of heartache in college. And there was this space, there was this spot on our campus that was hidden. It was up on our practice field that was elevated. So it was away from the rest of the campus. And there was a, bu- a building up there that wasn't lit. Nobody was ever up there. And I would go and I'd sit behind that building. And it was just me and the stars and God. And that was my place of peace. And I'd go there, oh man, so many times. And just be alone. Sometimes I'd cry, sometimes I'd sing, sometimes I'd pray, sometimes I'd read, sometimes I'd just sit there, sometimes I'd yell at God, sometimes I'd just be crying out. But that was my place of peace, and it was a place of healing, and it was a place of rest and recovery, no commotion. The Bible is full of places like that for every single one of us. Everybody wants a cabin by the lake that they can rest in and heal. The Bible is full of places like that. There are literally thousands of them in there. Did you know that there are 8,810 promises in the Bible and 7,487 of them are God promising things to you? That is 7,487 cabins by the lake for you to rest in. 
places of peace for you. I have some of these that I go back to over and over and over again. A dozen of them are in Psalm 119. I just camped out there when we first moved to Charlotte. Psalm 119 was my home. I didn't, I didn't put up a little hammock. I built a cabin. And I just hung out there for over a year in Psalm 119. And I just feasted, rested in this, this chapter. Another one of these little cabins that I like to go back to a lot is Isaiah 55. Um, I'll just be vulnerable with you for a little bit here. Um, I'm a preacher, in case you didn't know, know that. Um, so I, I uh, every Monday, I open up the Bible, and I study it, and I, and I, I read a passage, and then I read all these commentaries, and I, I try to craft an outline, and then I find illustrations, and then I write it all out. And then at the end of the week, I stand up in front of you, and I, I show you what I found. And then after I'm done with this, I get in my car, and I drive. And as soon as I get in my car, I think, did I, did I just do anything? Like, what just happened? You know, like, I'm not, I, I don't know. I can't see anything. Like, you know, jobs, some jobs you, like, do a task and you see that it's done and you're like, sweet, I did it, it's done. Um, but I can't do anything. I'm just a man. I just, I just speak up here. I can't do anything in your hearts. Only the Spirit can. I don't see any of that. That's why, I like, I love mowing my lawn because it's long and then I mow it and it's short. And I'm like, I did something. Like, <laughs> That felt really good. And so I struggle with doubt. You know, that's one of my struggles. And, and, and I struggle with like, man, is this, is, this, is this accomplishing anything? And so one of my places of peace in the Bible is Isaiah 55. I go back to this cabin by the lake all the time, week in, week out. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that which I purpose. It will succeed in the thing for which I sent it. That's not me saying that. That's God saying that. God saying every time his word goes out, it doesn't matter how weak I am or how bad I am or whatever, it will accomplish what it sets out to accomplish. That's a, that's a place of peace for me. That's a cabin by the lake for me. There are places like that for you too. And your vulnerability and your weakness, I don't know what you're struggling with today, but you're struggling with something. There's a cabin by the lake for you in the word of God. There are dozens of them there for you where you can find rest for your souls. It's the most valuable treasure in the whole world because it leads us to thousands of those places. It leads us to peace. And that brings us to the final thing I want to show you. This is the most important thing that I want to show you. The word of God is the greatest treasure in the world because it leads us to Jesus Everything hinges on this. Psalm 119, verse 18, David cries out, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. What are the wondrous things that he wants to see? Verse 135 tells us, I want to see your face. Make your face shine upon me. Teach me your statutes. I remember when I was 14, I was up in Virginia with my cousins. My grandpa had just built a shed. It was unfinished. It was not air conditioned or anything like that. My cousins and I were like, let's get some sleeping bags and sleep in the shed. And I remember this so vividly. We were out there. We thought we were so cool. And eighth grade, 14 years old. I was not a Christian at this point. I don't know if they were. And I'll never forget the conversation that we were having as we were sleeping in this cabin. There was a really popular song on the radio at that time, uh, Christian radio at the time. Um, and it was called, I Want to Know You. I think that's what it was called. And the lyrics were like, I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. And I'll never forget we were laying on the floor and we were trashing this song. Like just absolutely trashing it. To me, the idea of seeing God's face was like as ridiculous as, are there other kids in here right now? I, I can't say it. Let's go with uh, Easter Bunny. Easter Bunny. As ridiculous as the Easter Bunny. I've made this mistake too many times in the past about another holiday. Um, um, that's what I thought a real 
tangible encounter with God was like. And so for anybody to say, I want to see God's face, I was like, what an idiot. Like, he might be there, but if he's there, he's a spirit, you can't see his face. And even if you, even if you could see his face, like, where is he? You know, like, sing all you want. I don't know why that's a cool song. To me, it was stupid. And I'll never forget this conversation. And honestly, even after I got saved, I had no idea what it meant to see God's face at all. I had no idea what it meant to encounter the presence of God. I'd always hear about these great fathers of the faith and all of these people talking about their encounters with Jesus and presence of God, like fire and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, I want that, but what is that? What does it mean to experience the presence of God? What I want to show you right now is that at its core, the real treasure of the word is that it actually is the vehicle that drives us into the presence of God. This is so important. Everything I've said about happiness and truth and peace hinges on this. And that's the fact that the Bible is in fact Jesus in print. And so if you want to see the face of God and if you want to experience his presence, it's in the book. Now let me explain that because I know that makes no sense to you because you're modern. And, and the idea of like a supernatural, metaphysical, supernatural like existence world doesn't make sense to us as moderns, right? Let me explain this to you. In John 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know this passage. It's very famous. He doesn't say, I know the way. He says, I am the way. He doesn't say, I know the truth. He says, I am the truth. I, I don't know how to find the good life. I am the life, okay? So all of those things are a part of him. But then if you go back to John 6, and specifically in John 6, 63, do you know what he says about his word? He says, my word is spirit and life. So on the one hand, he's the way, the truth, and the life. But then he says, when I speak, my voice is those things. And so somehow his voice, his word is his presence. And when I say somehow, I know how. It's through the spirit. Wherever his word is, his spirit is carrying it along. I just read Isaiah 55. And so the power that happens right now in this moment has nothing to do with me. It has to do with the word going out and the spirit carrying it. And every time I speak his word, guess what? He's here. The spirit of the living God is in the word. This is so powerful, guys. This changes everything. It's so significant. When he speaks his spirits here, the word of God is the presence of God and the presence of God is the face of God. That's why the apostle Paul said the word is alive and it's active. It's because the word is a person. When we open up the book, he is there. The joyful, loving, faithful, gentle, patient, and kind face of God, ready to meet us. So David says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I want to see you. Make your face so that it shines upon me. I want to burn with that heat that comes from your presence. I don't just want to remember your precepts. I want to bask in your presence uh, Uh, I want the word to lead me to happiness, but he knew that happiness was only found in Jesus. He didn't know who Jesus was at the time. Now we know. Guys, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes this takes a lot of work. Sometimes this takes a lot of time. Sometimes it takes a lot of effort and a lot of energy. And so I know I've found in my own life that there are, there are times I open up the, the word, and, I, and I'm going to teach you how to do this at the end, and, you know, four weeks from now. I'm going to teach you how to do this because you don't have to be a seminary guy to do this. There are times when I open it up, and I'm looking for the face of God, and I don't find it right away. And it's hard, and it's frustrating, and it's work, and there's prayer involved, and there's meditation. And it's a back and forth, and sometimes it takes hours. But don't stop until you find him. 
Don't stop until you see him. Don't stop until you hear him because he's there. And sometimes he just likes to see the effort, I think. Jesus says this. This is a promise. If you seek me, you will find me. Revelation 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'm going to come in and I'm going to dine with him and he with me. A lot of times we think he's talking to unbelievers there. A lot of times we think that he's standing on the door of the unconverted and he's saying, if you would just open up the door, I'd come in and I'd have fellowship with you. He's not writing to unbelievers. He's writing to the church at Laodicea. He's writing to believers. He's saying, believer. You've already got me, but I'm still outside and I'm banging on the door and I just want to come in, so let me in. And I I know he's saying that to some of you right now. Because you've believed and you trust, but you're American and we struggle with this because we're so comfortable and there's so many other things that distract us and there's so much noise and there's so much TV and all of this stuff and he's banging at the door and he's like, listen, if you would just let me in, you would see my face and we would fellowship together. That would lead to happiness, that would lead to truth, that would lead to peace. The word of God is the most valuable treasure in the world because it is Jesus in print. How many of us have kept him outside waiting and knocking and longing? Word of God is the most valuable treasure in the world because it leads us to happiness. It leads us to truth. It leads us to peace. And so we read it ultimately because it leads us to Jesus and all of those things are found in him. Let me close with this story and then we'll worship together and we'll pray together and we'll go to the table together. I read this story this past week. (laughs) This made me laugh. Garbage delivery guy back in, I think, 1995. Uh, his name was Randall, Craig Randall. Drove a garbage truck in Peabody, Massachusetts. And, and one day he was out making his rounds and he just so happened to see a Wendy's cup for like soda, you know. Um, and, and on that cup was an unopened sticker for one of those contests, like where you get the free burgers and fries and stuff like that. And he's like, sweet. So he jumps out of his truck. I mean, what kind of, this is amazing, right? Um, he, he's going through the garbage and he picks up this cup and, and, he, and he's hoping for a burger. He's hoping for some fries. Or he doesn't know what he's going to get. Maybe nothing, but he's hoping. And he, he pulls this sticker off, but it's not a burger and it's not fries. It's $200,000 to the construction of a new home. <laughs> and I read this story that I couldn't help but laugh because if that's not the perfect example of another one man's trash is another man's treasure, I don't know what it is. Um, let me just close with this encouragement. The level of truth that you understand and walk in And the level of happiness that you experience today and the level of peace that you enjoy in your life depends on whether or not you view the Bible as a throwaway or a treasure. Everything hinges on that. And so I beg you today, make it a treasure. Get it off the shelf, dust it off, open it up. See the face of God. Amen.